Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world again. <laughs> um, I ended up, we had a little bit of space in between here, so I ended up introducing Joe Roxton, virtually sitting next to me right now. So, um, yeah, here we go again. And as I ended my, my, my speech on it, we would not have this conversation today without produced documentaries about our environment and social impact of our world. So I'm pleased to introduce Joe Roxton, the producer of A Plastic Ocean, which by the way, can see on Netflix. Joe is a passionate campaigner for the oceans. And I need not to say much more about Joe because I think everything will come clear within the next 20 minutes. So I hope you stay tuned on what Joe has to say and that you will support her next film, which is hope and the love for our oceans. Over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, good morning, everyone. So yes, I'm the founder of Ocean Generation. Um, we started in 2009, and it was when I decided to make the film A Plastic Ocean. Um, it took eight years to make, and uh, part of that was because it was so difficult to get funds because it was just as we'd had the global recession. I don't half pick my moments. Um, but for those of you that have not seen the film, um, I'm just going to start by showing a trailer just to set the scene. I remember the first time I saw a blue whale. Oh, look, look. Oh, wow. I followed them since childhood. What do you think it's from? Is it from a ship? I can see plastic everywhere. We were in what we thought was a relatively pristine environment. I started to wonder what was happening in oceans elsewhere on the planet. Growing up, my world was the ocean. It's where I feel the most spiritual. As a freediver, it was the place where I proved myself to myself. Finally, have the opportunity to pay the sea back. Only a fraction the plastic that we produce is recycled. This is never going to degrade. It's got nowhere to go. This was something that these animals, they were forced to endure because it was man-made and we put it into their environment. The record is 276 pieces of plastic inside of one 90-day-old chick. If the plastics are in the food chain for the dolphin, they're also in our food chain. Exactly. The communities are built on these landfill sites. So sweet potatoes, corn, sugar cane. <laughs> All growing on 40 years of garbage. Do you have anything not wrapped in plastic? No. No. <laughs> we have to make our life better for our kids' children. Change is possible. It starts when I started making the film, um, global plastic production was just under 300 million tons a year. And of that, um, about 8 million tons gets into the ocean every year. By the time we were five years in, that amount had already gone up to 315 million tons a year. I hope I said million at the beginning. Um, and now it's um, over 400 million tons a year. And the prediction from Plastics Europe is that it will be 1.8 billion tons per year by two, uh, 2050. So my concern is, if we allow the equivalent of today's global plastic production to get into the ocean within the next 60 million years, then the ocean won't be able to cope. Already, we are allowing into the ocean the global equivalent of plastic production from 1960. So for me, it was quite an interesting subject to use for the film because I, I didn't want the film to be all doom and gloom. I wanted people to understand there was something they could do about it. And plastic is a product that was designed not to break down. It was designed to defy nature, and yet we're making single-use items out of it. And we're told we can throw it away. And when you throw something away, you have this 
idea in your head that somehow it just disappears. Well, it doesn't, and so much is getting into the ocean. And once in the ocean, of course, the animals there can't tell the difference between what they should be eating and plastic because they're just opening their mouths and taking in seawater. Before I go any further, I'd just like to point out that as an organization, we're not anti-plastic. We do recognize that plastic is very, very much needed in our lives and it's enhanced them hugely. And I think that nowhere is this more relevant than perhaps in medicine. And we've certainly seen so much of that recently. And just to give a demonstration of that, I think the most vulnerable um, humans that we can, we can imagine are babies that are born too soon. And the baby on the left was born 11 weeks early. And she was actually born into a plastic bag to keep her from infection while they took her to the incubator and started to attack, attach single-use plastic tubing to her to help her breathe, to bring her medication and to feed her. And then a year later, her little sister was born and it was the same thing. Now, these it's a very personal thing because these are two of my granddaughters. And I actually think that without single use plastic, I wouldn't even have those little girls in my life. So I'm certainly not anti-plastic. It's what we're doing with it and the ridiculous things that we make with it that we need to rethink. So when I was starting to make the film, I'd heard about this phenomenon called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I was told that it was a floating island of plastic out in the Pacific Ocean, that it was 10 meters deep, that it was three times the size of Spain. And as, as somebody who who's, has a science degree, I, I have a very inquiring mind. And I started to look into this and thought, well, if that's the case, why is it that the astronauts up on the space station are not sending photos back of this giant island of plastic in the Pacific? And then I looked at other statistics that were saying things like how long it would take a disposable nappy, a, a diaper to, to disappear. And they were saying 500 years and then plastic bottles. Another one I hear a lot, 450 years. But plastic was only invented 150 years ago. So what was the truth behind this? And uh, the first thing I did was to um, find my way onto a scientific expedition that was going out to the center of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And this photograph is taken right there at the center. And as you look at it, it's the most beautiful Pacific blue. Um, we, we couldn't see this, this floating island of trash. And if you're under the boat, again, it's as if you're free falling from a plane. The, the ocean looks as beautiful as we always imagined the Pacific to be. But what the scientists were doing right from the time we left San Francisco was putting in nets to trawl for plankton on the surface of the ocean. And we actually created another net that would trawl two meters below just to see what we would find, because what they were saying was that plastic that leaves our shores takes about 20 years to get to the center of the ocean by the time it's been picked up by the massive ocean currents. And during that time, it's subjected to sunlight, to wave action, to salt water. And plastic, as you know, gets brittle over time. So all that time in the ocean, it breaks up and breaks up and breaks up into tiny pieces. So what we found 400 miles west of San Francisco in the trawl was these tiny pieces of plastic. And I was horrified seeing those. I couldn't believe that this gorgeous water had this much in it, but actually that was nothing. And the closer we got to the center of the, of the ocean, the more we realized that this is the true nature of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Every single trawl was coming up full of these small pieces of plastic. And you could see the little tiny planktonic creatures in there, the heart of the food chain, and they have transparent bodies, a lot of them. And you could see that they'd been eating the plastic as well. And this is from labor laboratory photos, but the green pieces are labeled plastic so that you can see these creatures don't distinguish between plastic and what they should be eating. Sometimes it blocks their guts, sometimes it manages to get through. But of course, this is the heart of the marine food chain. Now, the other problem with plastic is that from the day it enters the ocean, it starts to attract chemicals like a magnet. And these are chemicals that are there from decades of industrial effluent and agricultural runoff, including things like DDT that was banned in the 70s. It's still out there and it just happens to love plastic. 
And one of the things that it loves more than plastic is fat. So once it's consumed by the larger animals, so eating these tiny creatures and the bigger fish will eat the fish that eat those, it gets released and stored in the fatty tissues. And of course, humans are top predators in the marine food chain. And these chemicals have been associated with all kinds of critical disease. Now, laboratory tests obviously are very intense. The levels that they're testing will be very high. But my question is, why are we letting it get into the ocean at all now that we know? So it was quite difficult as a filmmaker to try and think how I could make little nets of plastic look interesting. But then I realized, of course, that the most charismatic and the largest creature that's ever lived on our planet, the blue whale, feeds on plankton. So what I wanted to do was find out if these whales are eating plastic. Now, when a blue whale opens its mouth, it takes in many, many liters of seawater and then it squeezes its throat closed and the, and the animals in it get caught on the baleen plates and that's what it will eat. So a blue whale, every time it opens its mouth, an adult will take in 75,000 liters of seawater. And this is what we were finding around the area where these blue whales were feeding. And this is about 30 miles south of um, the southern part of Sri Lanka, so in the Indian Ocean. And the whales feed at the continental shelf there. So they're coming up, taking in huge mouthfuls of seawater. And, um, and this is what we found there. So there's no question that they're consuming it. We wanted to know as well what was happening on the ocean floor. And we'd been talking to a deep sea biologist who'd been studying the, the what he calls the debris fields in the Mediterranean. So areas where the plastic is collecting. What happened was when we got to um, the south of France to, to go and join the crew that had the submersible, um, the weather was so bad, it wasn't safe enough for us to get out to where we needed to be. So all we could do was launch the sub in a safe area. And we didn't know if we would find plastic on the bottom of the ocean or not. But sure enough, we didn't need to wait long. And, uh, and it was there. So that actually made a stronger story because it wasn't a place where we were expecting to find it. Something else that made me start looking at this film was seeing pictures of albatross chicks. And the, these ones, this is the Laysan albatross, and they breed on a little island uh, called Midway, which is the very end of the Hawaiian chain. And I'm sure that talking to the people I'm talking to right now, everyone's very well aware of where Midway is. Um, and about 40% of the chicks there are dying because the parents, instead of feeding them the the squid and the fish that they would normally pick up from the surface because these little creatures will reflect the light so the birds will scoop down and grab it. They then feed it whole to their chicks and a lot of them are dying from just eating plastic. And the, the one on the left really gets to me actually because you can see there are two of those um, cigarette lighters in there, the ones that you can't refill. And the very fact that we created those out of plastic um, and, and then when they run out, you, you can't refill them. It just seems one of those crazy things that we should never have done. So we ended up filming uh, three bird sequences. And I'm just going to show you a little clip from one of them. And uh, you, you can see um, the cameraman fi filming a little bird there. And this is a shearwater. And it's just fledged and it's trying to make its way to the ocean. And that particular morning, this one was really struggling. And that particular morning, we, we picked up 10 of these birds um, on the beach, and uh, I'll show you what we found. Yeah, the stomach is very, very full. And if we look here, uh, there's some very dark pieces, some very light white pieces. And if you see, you know, as I push on this, it's absolutely rigid. Oh, look at that. Absolutely no doubt this bird died Stunt as a result of that plastic. That is literally a gut full of plastic. It's quite alarming, isn't it? Oh, oh wow, look at the size of that big black piece. That is an enormous piece of plastic. Unbelievable. I hope nobody's still having breakfast. Um, so that, that to me, every bird on that bench was exactly the same. 
So since we've been um, working in that area, an awful lot has changed. When we started, nobody was talking about plastic. None of the green groups were, apart from a couple that were doing beach cleans. And we were determined to make people aware of the problem, to encourage solutions, to encourage new legislation. And so much of that is now in place. So at Ocean Generation, we're focusing now on bigger ocean issues with the goal to, to um, restore a healthy and sustainable relationship between humanity and the ocean. And when we think about the ocean now, what's happened with more and more environmental films coming out that talk about the problem of plastic and the problems in, in the ocean is that we're hearing more and more about ocean acidification, about pollution, about overfishing and, and, and deep sea mining. And the problem is when we constantly are bombarded with problems, the only way we deal with it is not to think about it. And, and I'm guilty of this as well, because ocean acidification is, is something that, that really does concern me. And, and of course, it's linked to climate change. But what we want to do is to change the narrative about this, because the more doom and gloom that's fed to us, the more we give up hope. And with the ocean, there are so many reasons to hope. So we're, we're focusing on education. We're focusing particularly on young people, but that, that's, that's only because so many of our materials are already focusing in that area. We actually believe that anybody on the planet now is part of this ocean generation because we're the ones that can change this around. So it doesn't matter whether you're zero or 100 or more than 100, this is our chance to, to restore the balance. So in our Ocean Academy, we're looking at different areas, and I'm not going to go through all of them now, but know that we have teaching materials, uh, education resources for teachers, for people, uh, for students studying them, but also we run workshops for, um, for, for people who want to bring in ocean conservation into all the work that they do to consider it um, in, in their work, using their own talents and their own in interests. So it's something that everybody can become involved with. So when we think about the ocean, what we want to do instead of focusing on the problems is actually to see the ocean as a solution, particularly when it comes to climate change, because a healthy ocean is so important to redress the balance. If I say to you the word swamp, probably you'll conjure up in your mind images like this. Where, where did Shrek live? And then, of course, swamp monsters. We're told right from a very early age that swamps are dirty places. And then you'll often hear shouts of drain the swamp. And this is actually what's happening. Mangrove forests and, and, and the very critical habitats at the edge of the ocean are being drained for development. And it's causing so many different problems for the creatures that live there because these areas are vital for nursery grounds for fish in particular but not only that to actually absorb co2 and a mangrove um a mangrove stand will absorb up to four times more co2 than our rainforests and it's the same with our salt marshes these areas and and, and seagrass beds they are so important for absorbing co2 so we need to restore these and we need to protect the ones that we have for all of our sakes. One of the areas that we're looking at in the new film is ocean sound. And this is something that I want to be very uplifting because I think it's fascinating, but we also need to understand why it's important that we, we protect the ocean soundscape. So I'm gonna show you a very small piece now um, from a teaser film that we've put together in order to raise funds for the new film. <laughs> Scientists are now using cutting edge technology to listen to the ocean, studying it and understanding more about it all the time. We used to think of the ocean as a silent world, but we didn't know how to listen to it properly. Sound travels fast and far underwater. And for most marine creatures, it's a vital part of their world. They use sound to hunt to fight, to reproduce. We've discovered 
the even tiny planktonic larvae, the next generation of fish, lobsters, clams, and corals can all find their way home to a healthy coral reef by the way it sounds. I'm going to start uh, playing another sound that, that you might not recognize, and it's one that I've only discovered recently. There's so much about ocean sound that we don't know, but we, the more we find out about it, the more we realize how vital it is for communication. And these are the scientists listening to this particular creature. And that's what it is. This is a Weddell seal in Antarctica. So the more we find out about it, the more we realize that we need to understand how these creatures are communicating and everything we know is how vital it is. So we're interested to bring in solutions into the end of the film. And if, if there are people who, who are working in this field, perhaps to reduce ocean uh, to reduce engine noise and that kind of thing. I would love to talk to them because I want this film to be full of hope and I see a lot of hope from, from everything I hear um, about how people are trying to address these problems. I'm just going to let uh, Sir David Attenborough tell the next bit um, because as much as I can tell you about the importance of the ocean, when you hear it in his voice, I think it makes everybody sit up and listen. Every second breath you take comes from the oceans. Every drop of water, indeed, everything we drink has come from the oceans. They are an important source of protein for billions of people on the planet. They absorb much of the carbon dioxide we produce. The ocean is our life support system. If that system becomes dysfunctional, then all living things on this planet will suffer. If the oceans could talk, what would they say? Um, so David did that in one take, and uh, as I'm sure you know, he's, he's as passionate about the ocean um, as I am. So if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to do my best to answer them. And uh, the website, I'm not sure if you can see, because mine's blocked out there, and it's uh, oceangeneration.org. Thank you, Joe, for, for this very enlightening uh, talk. I don't know where to start, because I'm still a bit flabbergasted about what's been said. Some I knew, some I actually didn't know. So we're still we're still learning. It also tells me that there's such a need for education um, when it comes to our oceans, when it comes to our environment. Um, I had showed a, a slide earlier in, in, in my presentation about there's a survey done uh, on different age groups where these age groups were more concerned about COVID or climate change. And it showed clearly that the younger generations were much more concerned about climate change than COVID. And even though they weren't the first to get the vaccine either. But as, <laughs> as you go further up the line here, it became quite, quite clear that as people got older, they were much more concerned about COVID than climate change. Um, so I'm going to ask you a bit, bit of a difficult question here. Hmm. Why do you think that is? I think people are actually focusing on their own lives. And I think that they're thinking about the immediate future, whereas young people have got their whole lives ahead of them. Um, I, I have to say, when I had children, um, I suddenly realized that I cared 30 years beyond my life. Now I have grandchildren, I, I care 60 years beyond my life. In Hawaii, they have a fantastic, um, I'm not sure how to describe it, sort of a concept. They always consider seven generations beyond theirs. So whatever they're doing now, they're thinking, how is this going to affect seven generations? And I think if we all did that, we would be protecting our, our planet a lot better. 
I've, I've just seen some questions go fast um, and, uh, and, and, and I can't see them all. But one of them was, I, I, I think it was from a, la a lady called Bev, um, who said that, um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, this saying that knowledge acquisition is not enough to elicit behavioral change. Um, when it comes to plastic, and I, I completely understand that, and I think it's it's not just knowledge. Although raising awareness has made people very very determined, particularly the younger people who will nag the older generations, and I've witnessed this in in, in schools and and in families. I don't think it's just knowledge. I think legislation has to has to um, change as well, so that people, um, you know, those that don't care or or, or perhaps have never bothered to find out. There's no way they can continue to behave because those those single use lighters won't be there. They, you know, any country where you can pour clean water out of your tap should not be selling it in plastic bottles. And I think that if people understand right from the get go that the ocean is our life support system, even if you live in the centre of Australia, you can't breathe without the ocean providing it. So why on earth wouldn't we be protecting it? So knowledge is a huge is a huge start. And, and certainly that's that's what what we're doing. Um, and then I think legislation and, and um, solutions that there's so many other things, but it's one part of the jigsaw that, that we contribute to. Right, I, I hope that's a question for you. I, I, sorry, am I? Am I... Do, do, do you see the question, Joe? Which one? There's one from Marie Pennanen, your views on increasing sea temperatures and coral bleaching. Yes, no, that that is that is something that concerns me hugely, actually. And in fact, I, I did some filming, gosh, a long time ago, um, would have been in, right at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, working with um, Professor Ove Ho Gilberg, who was looking at how coral bleaching was happening in, in the barrier reef. And I, yes, and, and I don't I don't have an immediate solution to that other than everybody getting on board with um with making changes in their own lives you know turning your heating down by one degree or, or turning your aircon up by one degree choosing to walk choosing to take uh, public transport all the things that we can individually do in our own lives um one of the things that anybody with an instagram account can do is by following ocean generation for every follow we will plant one mangrove in um in, in uh, Madagascar, we're working with a program there, and then know that that tree is gonna be offsetting some of the stuff that you're doing, although it will take a lot more than that. But if everybody gets involved with just making some changes in their own life, everybody needs to feel part of the solution and to understand that they can do something. Correct. Um, we'll just, I, I can't see if there's more questions coming up. Um, but you're an experienced diver, and I know you've been part yes. of documentaries. Uh, and I've talked to you before, and uh, you reveal some of the things you've seen. Um, and you always talk about hope. Whenever I speak to you, Joe, you always talk <laughs> yeah. about this. So why, why do you think there's hope? What, what, bring, I mean, what brings you so much comfort in that, 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 that there still is hope? Well, I think because I work with a lot of people that are that are working on solutions. And the other thing is, I wouldn't be doing what I'm what I'm doing now if if I if I didn't have hope. I think it. I think it, we can focus too much on the negative, but I, I think there's a lot being done, and certainly the changes I've seen since 2009 when I started on the plastics thing. You know, it seemed like this massive problem, and everyone's using it all the time. And, and yes, there's still an awful lot around, but it, it, it's the it's the changes. You know, the alternatives that have come out. The the people I speak to, you know, when I go to schools now, the kids can't wait to tell me what they already know, whereas before everything was new to them. And and just to give you one story about that, a, a particular school I spoke to, and it was it was a primary school, so everyone's under 11, and it was only a 20-minute assembly, and uh, the kids were all watching away and, you know, get some good questions at, at the end. And then the catering manager of the school came up and said, look, I'm not going to stop selling water in plastic bottles in this school. It, it brings in a profit of £10,000 a year. And I'm kind of thinking, do I start lecturing or do I kind of think, well, you know, some you win, some you lose. Um, but the teacher called the next term and said, since that presentation, not one child had bought the water in the school shop. 
And it got even better than that because at the end of the summer term, the teacher had come in with ice creams and the kids were all delighted until they opened the box and every single ice cream was in a novelty plastic cone and all of them refused it. So uh, it, it's the younger people that give me hope, but it, it doesn't stop there because a lot of people are, are showing me what they're buying, what they're bringing. There's refill shops happening. These supermarkets are doing a lot now. Yes, it, we, you know, it's easy to say, but they're not doing this and they're not doing that. But let's look at what they are doing, because that's where it, it's hope that's going to take us forward in this. All right. Yeah, um, I mean, I obviously also engage with a lot of different people, getting a lot of questions doing the way. Um, but I, I still think some people don't really see the problem. I mean, they, they know there is a problem, but they and I, I think I call it information overload. We're always yes. talking about and that's always. where legislation will come in. Yeah, I think it's difficult for most to understand what can I do, little me. I mean, how I'm going to change the bigger picture. Does it mm. help that I put out plastic water bottles? I no, mean, absolutely. But then, it, it, you know, to mitigate behavior and to mitigate things that you can't change, that, that's where people like Ocean Generation come in because this is what we do. And this is, you know, the, 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 this is the work that we're doing, the materials we're producing, the presentations, yeah. the workshops that we're running and, and, and so on. He's mentioned the hashtag for the manga. Oh, um, hashtag Ocean Generation will find us. So the minute you follow us, um, then then uh, there will be um, there will be a mangrove tree planted. Thanks to you. Perfect. Um, yeah, I I don't see many more questions coming in. How the suggestions how does, coming in, which is great. Yeah. Um, how do people get in contact with you? Because I know you're, you're, you're fundraising for your next documentary, which is about hope yes. and love for the ocean. And I've seen yes. uh, what you showed today and a bit more than that. Um, and I know you, you, we, 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 we've talked about engine noise reduction will help marine yes. life a whole lot. And you're asking if there are owners, ship owners, managers listening to, to, to this today who have or doing uh, engineering work on, on new ships yes, coming love with, to know. with noise reduction, you want to get in touch with. How, how do people get in touch with you, Rox? Jo Rox um, I'm Rox. just jo, jo at oceangeneration.org. Um, and right. again, if you go to our website, if you forget, if you get forget the Joe bit, you can go to hello at plastic at that uh, oceangeneration.org. Yeah, and if people are in doubt, you can also contact us by by email. Yes, we'll yes of course, right yes. Away. No, that would be my best Christmas present ever to know that I can get going on the next film. <laughs> yeah. I'm itching to start. Got it. Hmm. Well, um, are there any more questions from the back room? Tanzania has banned plastic bags, which is brilliant. Yes. I, I, it's interesting. I've just been in, in, in the US actually, and um, there's the, there is so much plastic going on. But then when you go to the supermarkets, at least everything's in, in boxes and, and, and bags and a lot of people are bringing their own in. I, I, I do see change in behavior. Maybe it's not fast enough, but maybe it will suddenly accelerate. Maybe we can accelerate the changes at the same rate that the plastic producers are planning to produce plastic and suddenly they'll think, hmm, maybe we, we need to look at something else. Yeah. No, I certainly hope so. And I'd mentioned earlier that, you know, our initiative of removing plastic bottles from the ocean going vessels is it's growing. We had our 30 second pleasure coming in this yesterday afternoon. And, uh, but I want more traction. I want it to move faster. I want people really yeah. to engage in it and use new innovation, use a new solution. Simply yeah, just do absolutely. it. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have more people joining our efforts and the other two 32 pledges in, in the Marine. And hey, Stephen. Yes, Joe, what a wonderful presentation that was. Um, really uh, beautifully, um, beautifully put forward. Um, there's so many questions we could be asking you. I mean, I'm very keen to know if we can actually, you know, a lot of our focus is about reducing plastic and stopping further plastic getting into the ocean. But um, I'd love to talk to you later um, as, as time's ticking on about whether we can take what's in the ocean out now. I don't know, just a moment on that. Have you, are you seeing any work done on taking out? Of, of I think we can, I think prevention is better than that. I think we should be looking at our river mouths, which are delivering a lot of it to actually go and remove all the little tiny pieces. Of course, you would take the, the vital plankton layer out as well. And, and the phytoplankton, the plant, plankton which sits at the top absorbing co2 and producing um, 
absorbing CO2 and producing oxygen for us, the last thing you want to do is scrape all of that off the surface as well. Um, but but uh, certainly working closer to the shorelines to prevent it, I think, is hugely important um, and to stop it getting there. Right. Um, so important that we stop the escalating, you know, yeah. momentum then. So, yeah, and, and discarded um, fishing nets as well because they fragment into tiny plastic pieces. Hmm. All right. Well, um, we have to move on. Um, Joe, thank you so much for the presentation. Mikhail, thank you as as well for um, for facilitating that with Joe. And um, I'm sure Can I that just the... Quickly, I'm sorry, Stephen, to interrupt. Just one question's yeah. come in that's caught my eye right. um, from, from Martin McMahon saying, uh, the noise under the ocean from ships is massive, but we can't hear it. How can you put this message more out to the public? That's exactly what we want to do with the film. Because if people understand the complex soundscape of the ocean and understand how we're damaging it, that there, there is um, experiments that have been done, even on moving where small ships are coming into dive platforms, where parent fish suddenly stop corralling all their little larvae and protecting them, and then just making a movement of 50 meters away has made a huge difference. So once people understand the problem, once people are... Are, are sort of engaged with what's happening in the ocean that's when the, the, the clever people will come in to, to start looking at solutions so for me it's about getting the information out there so that people understand and i'm sorry Stephen, i've just cut you up and i'm now going over time that's absolutely uh, absolutely no problem at all um this is only the beginning for the connection between impra and ocean generation and i think uh, mikhail you've got a lot of plans to continue to support ocean generation moving forward so i'm sure we'll be hearing from from joe again and and hopefully seeing her in person um yes. very soon um so uh i have to move on um thank you very much again um good luck with all of your work joe and and we'll thank talk you. to you soon thanks for inviting me and happy christmas to everyone yeah likewise thank you.